Very good morning, everybody. International Sunday tonight. I'm half Irish, did you know that? I'm half Irish. I grew up in Belfast. My mother is Irish. My grandparents are Irish. My aunties and uncles are Irish. My dad is my only English relative. And uh, so I just wanted to let all South Africans church this morning know that, that um, I'm Irish. You didn't know that, did you? I'm representing Ireland this morning. Monica is away, otherwise she would be here in full Irish regalia. But, um, but I'm half Irish, so I can do it too. That's good, isn't it? I'm a little bit quiet this morning. That's good, isn't it? I noticed the 9.30 was a little quieter than normal this morning. There was a few people missing. If you know what I'm talking about, you're obviously not watching any rugby. Anyway, back on the topic. How about standing to your feet? Bring the Holy Spirit back, John, please. <laughs> Very good. Well, we just want to take a moment to pray uh, over our giving this morning. Um, if you'd like to give, you can do so via that QR code. Uh, won't be passing any buckets this morning. I know many of us have given online. So how about just we lift our hands. In a way, we're just presenting our giving back to God this morning. Father, we thank You for the opportunity to be able to give to You. And we just honour You right now, God, with our finances. And I just thank You, Lord, the Bible's so clear that God, when we live Your way, Lord, You do take care of the rest. When You are our shepherd, Lord, the Bible says, we will be without need. So God, right now, as we bring our gift to You, we also just bring our needs to You. We bring everything that we're asking for, everything that we're in need of, and we just say, Father, would You take care of us, Your children, Your family this morning? You know, just with your eyes closed, just for a moment, just as we sung that song, call the name. Just really felt this morning, some of us just need to call on the name of Jesus, amen. Call whatever you need, just call on His name. Need a breakthrough? Call on His name. Need God to do something? Call on His name. And I believe as we do that, we're gonna see God do some pretty amazing things. So God, we do, we call on Your name this morning. You are such a wonderful God, and we honour You right now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. All right, well, you can grab a seat this morning. Fantastic. Well, good to be back. I was away for a week. I was preaching last weekend in, in Switzerland, uh, which was cool. It was a church camp. It was um, up in the Alps, which was um, pretty, pretty amazing, but um, they worked me pretty hard. I preached seven times uh, last weekend, and so I came home for a rest. And, but I heard my wife Monica did an amazing job last Sunday morning. And I know Esther did a fantastic job uh, last week at the 5 p.m., uh, so that's good. Hey, also good to have uh, Steve and Christine back from, uh, from New Zealand. Give these guys a big welcome. <laughs> Pastor Steve's going to be speaking tonight. And uh, if you didn't know already, Equippers College Year 2 kicks off tomorrow. So uh, we're really excited about Year 2 of college and, and seeing what God is going to do. Um, if you've got a Bible, I'd love with you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew 28. And if you're joining us for the first time, we're in a series called At the Core. Everyone say, At the Core. And uh, we're just looking at some values that we really believe are values that as believers should be at the core of who we are. So these are kingdom values. And, um, you know, we have a set of values as a church. We call them our heartbeats. Um, and we use the acronym H-E-A-R-T, heartbeats. And each one of those letters means something, and we're going through them each week. But um, rather than talking about it in a church culture, really, um, we've been a, kind of hoping at least to try and talk about them. At, what does this mean for us in our day-to-day -day lives? What does it mean from Monday to Saturday to have these values at the core of who we are? And if you haven't noticed already, we're not doing them in order, uh, that we're kind of just doing them in slightly different orders. But this morning, I want to talk to you about reaching out. R is for reaching out. Everyone say reaching out. I believe we're all called to reach out into the world in which God has placed us. 
Uh, we are to extend beyond the boundaries of what appears normal to us and go further and, uh, and believe for God to move. So Matthew 28 verse 18 says this. Um, this is Jesus' final command to us. And as you've heard me say before, his final command is our greatest priority. And it says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go. Everybody say go. <laughs> go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the ends of this age. And uh, so you're probably familiar with that scripture. Uh, if you've been in church any length of time, the Great Commission, uh, we are called to go. And I think sometimes we take this scripture, um, rather than being the great kind of commission, uh, we take it as the great suggestion. Like it's just a good idea. If you've got a bit of spare time on your hands, then maybe once a week you could, you could go out and you could do your evangelism. You know, if you could create a little bit of time somewhere, uh, you could go and, and you could do this. But I want to really today talk to you about this being part of our everyday lives and just completely normal to how we operate. Because that word go it can actually be translated like this. And I think this is a more helpful translation. Um, it's as you go. Everybody say, as you go. So it's not go as in, you know, create a program, create a strategy, uh, you know, uh, Wednesday night for an hour and a half, go into your high street and preach the gospel. That's not what I think it's trying to communicate, but rather it's saying as you go, as you go to work, as you go to your family gathering, as you go to your sports club, as you go into your school, as you go into your university, you know, as you go wherever God has called you to go, as you go, make disciples. Um, and making disciples is really helping people to become more like Jesus. How many of you know if the world was more like Jesus, it would look a whole lot better? Yeah. Amen. It would look a whole lot better if the world just looked more like Jesus because he's the best. Uh -huh. He is the, there's no one to compare to him. Uh, he is full of grace, full of truth, full of mercy, full of joy, full of peace, full of power, full of authority. If the world looked more like Jesus, man, the world we live in would just be radically improved, wouldn't it? And so it says, as you go, make disciples. Don't make it a strategy. Uh, don't make it a window in your week when you go and do your evangelism. But at the core of who we are, I believe we are to go and change the world. Somebody say amen if you believe it. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I'm sure you have. But if you look at our logo equippers, um, there's a little arrow at the end of it. Anybody ever noticed that before? I want a media team. If you, oh, there it is there. Um, have you ever noticed that? It's equippers and there's an arrow. And that arrow is actually really um, part of our mission because we actually believe that we are called not just to receive from God and enjoy from God and be part of this amazing thing called the church, uh, but just sit here every week. We are actually called to be arrows that are put in a bow, pulled back and fired into all of the world. You, you are actually an arrow in the kingdom of God. And your arrow can go places that I can't go and can go places that your neighbor can't go. But if it remains in the quiver and it's never pulled out and nothing's ever done with it, it will not actually do what it's called to do. And that's a picture of your life and my life. We're actually called to be like arrows and there's a whole message on that, on what an arrow is and how it's shaped and how it's formed and the giftings and the Holy Spirit working in it. But we're actually meant to be fired out across the communities where God has placed us to bring the gospel and the good news of Jesus. Amen? That's what Equippers College is all about. Equippers College is about taking a group of people and training and equipping and sharpening them to be fired out wherever it is that God wants them to go. But that's what church is as well. Church is an equipping process. 
where we are fired out into this world. So it's not if we go, it's as we go, let's actually let people know about Jesus, amen? Uh, now, here's the thing, um, or let me just read a couple more verses before I get to that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just in case you're kind of sitting there and you're saying, I'm not convinced. Um, I think that's your job as the pastor. I'm not convinced. Let, let, let me convince you this morning. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, um, all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. So we are now in relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. It goes on. It says, and God has given us, everyone say us. So that's all of us. That's the body of Christ, uh, not the clergy, not the vicars. He has given all of us this task of reconciling people back to God. God's given you a task. You are not purposeless in this life. You are not directionless. You are not without direction in this life. God has got a direction for you. And it's actually to go and help people be reconciled back to God. Isn't that cool? He goes on, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them, and then he repeats himself, and he has given us, everybody say us, this wonderful message. I got good news for you this morning. The message that God has given us is a good message. It's a great message. It's a message that despite what you've done in your world, amen, we can be reconciled back to God. That's good news. And I'm so glad as, you know, as, as a pastor, as a preacher, but as a disciple, that the message I carry is not condemnation and shame and guilt and fear and all that stuff. But the message we carry is God loves you. God loves you and He wants His family to be reconnected again. God's a family man. Did you know that? God's a family man and He wants His kids back in His family. And that is the message we carry. Ah, that's exciting. Man, you, you have a task this week. You have a task this week to carry this message of God uh, of reconciliation, of reconciliation. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this, For the Lord is not willing, somebody say He's not willing, that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. How good is that? It doesn't matter how bad you've been, how naughty you've been, how dysfunctional you've been, how messed up you've been. God says, there's not one that I don't want to be reconciled back to myself. That's the message we carry. And just in case you still really don't believe me, let me read you from Luke chapter 14. And this is the parable of the, of the rich man who, who hosted a beautiful banquet and people didn't want to come and they were too busy. And then in verse 23, he says this, then the master said to the servant, go out, everybody say go out, into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house might be full. Come on, right now, God is wanting us to compel people to come to Him. He wants His house full. Every empty seat in this auditorium should, should frustrate us. Every empty seat in this auditorium across this day should irritate us. We should go, man, that's the seat where someone who doesn't know Jesus right now needs to be sitting in. We shouldn't get comfortable, you know, with a half full room. It should annoy us. Does it annoy anyone? It sure as heck annoys me. And it's not because I want to preach to a bigger room. It's because that means that someone who should be there in God's economy that's not there right now. We're, we're, we're to go out. Now, here's, here's the problem. Let me tell you the problem with this message, reaching out. Many of us jump, I think, to the wrong conclusion about what reaching out is. Many of us, when we hear reaching out, here's what we think. We think I need to go out into the world and I need to preach the gospel. I need to find some willing person who will listen to me, throw the gospel down their neck. Anyone ever thought like that? Come on now, be honest. That's kind of, some of us, there's like some half hands went up right there. No one quite wanted to admit it. Now sometimes what we think reaching out is, reaching out is going out and it's standing in the middle of a high street and, and it's preaching turn or burn. 
Or we think reaching out is like every single friend you have needs to hear you, uh, you know, give uh, the Romans road to salvation uh, given to them every time you meet them. And if you haven't done that, then you failed. I want to say reaching out sometimes means preaching the gospel. Reaching out does sometimes mean mean us preaching the gospel. There are moments when we've journeyed with a person, loved a person, taken care of a person, been with a person, that a window of opportunity will open up when it's right for us to share Jesus with them. In fact, I love the way Rick Warren says it. Rick Warren says people's hearts are like clamshells. And most of the time they're closed to the truth of the gospel. But every now and again, they'll open. And it's normally through a painful situation. It's normally because somebody's gone through something that they're in pain, they're in hurt, and their heart opens for a minute. And he says, that is quite right, because we love people to put a seed of the gospel in their hearts at that moment. But what many of us sometimes do is people are shut and we try to thrust it in there anyway. How many of you know it never works? It never works just to throw it down somebody's neck. We've actually got to wait for those moments. So I I think reaching out can be a number of things. I think reaching out is sometimes simply listening to what is in a person's heart. Sometimes reaching out is just simply sitting down and having a coffee or a meal with somebody and just listening, really listening to what they're going through and what is happening in their lives. And and I think that's reaching out. That's expressing the love of God in that moment. I think reaching out is, is sometimes using the gift of hospitality. How many of you know, man, a great meal is a wonderful thing. And a great meal with great uh, uh, people in it is an even better thing. Uh, someone came to Monica and I uh, just last week, and, and they just said, listen, we've got a whole bunch of people in our world. They don't know Jesus. Some of them do rather, and some of them don't, and some of them are of different faiths, and, 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 and we just want to open our home, and, and, and we just want to love them, and this person has the gift of hospitality. This person, if you walk in their home, it's just one of those homes you wish was your home. Anyone ever been in a home like that? You're like, walk, I'd like to move in here. This is nicer than my home. And they just have the gift of hospitality, and they said, you know, would it be okay if I opened up my home and invited some of these people in? And I said, yes. Because it's motivated and rooted in love. She's not looking to preach the gospel. She's not looking to throw it down their neck. She's just wanting to create an environment where a hurting person can come in and be touched by love and generosity and hospitality. Sometimes just opening your home is reaching out to those people around you who need it. Sometimes reaching out is praying for people. Simply someone in a minute, in a moment of need. Um, If you say, could I pray for you? Like, could I just... Could I pray for you? That's reaching out. It's it's not trying to do anything crazy. It's just saying, I believe in a God who answers prayers. Can I pray for you? Sometimes reaching out is just being present with a person who's going through a tough time. Um, Esther in the front row here has a a powerful story of a really great friend of hers, a longtime friend of hers, who who didn't know the Lord and and, and sadly um, got ill with cancer. And she became really, really ill. And uh, I watched Esther throughout this time. Esther was amazing at just being present with this lady. She was married and has children. And Esther would just be present with her and just expressing God's love. I don't think she was preaching, but just was there for her, was present with her in those times. And then a moment came when her heart opened. A moment came when her heart opened and And she wanted to know about God. And in that moment, Esther was actually able to gently lead her into receiving Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And it wasn't long that she passed from this earth. And now she is partying in heaven with our Father. And we don't celebrate the fact she's passed, but we celebrate the fact that love was expressed to her when she was far from God. And a moment came when her heart did open. And somebody was able to just deposit that seed of truth. And today, there's one more in heaven with God. Come on, we greet our hands together. Just thank God for that for a moment. See, sometimes reaching out is 
sharing the gospel, but here's what reaching out is every time. Reaching out every time ought to be an expression of God's love. Can I just say, if you're gonna take up the, the Great Commission, if you're gonna take it seriously, if you're gonna go out into the world and, and you're, gonna, you're gonna compel people, can I say it has to be absolutely 100% motivated in a love for people. If we're not doing it out of a love for people, we are doing the wrong thing. In fact, there's a couple of motivations. Let me share with you a couple of times that we shouldn't be going out and reaching into the world. Number one, when it's motivated by guilt. Anyone ever reached out to somebody because you felt guilty? It's like, oh my goodness, Mark said, I need to reach out. I better go out this week. I better find someone, share the gospel with them so I can say that I did it. I don't really want to, but I feel guilty if I don't do it. Can I just say that the motivation of that is wrong and it's not where we find the grace of God. So don't reach out to your neighbor because you feel guilty. Reach out because you love them. Amen? All right, this one, the motivation of fear. Anyone ever reached out because they're fearful? One, you know, one day the Bible says we're going to stand before the Lord and He's going to say to whom much is given, much is expected. And, and, and that can make us think, oh my goodness, I've I, I got to get witnessing, I've got to get evangelizing, I've got to get reaching out. But please, don't reach out motivated by fear because I've discovered you can smell fear a long way away. And we don't want people to receive Christ on fear. We want people to receive Christ on the knowledge that they're loved by Him and what He's done for us. I, I even think sometimes the motivation of obedience alone, obedience alone, I'm, I'm not even convinced that's enough to cause us to go. Obedience to God's Word, 100%, but mixed with the love of God, that we love people, we love our neighbors, we love our families, we, we, come on, who, how many of you would be honest for a moment and just say, man, I, I just need to, probably need to love people a little more. Amen. I'm there. In fact, I was sharing with the first service this morning, you know, these five heartbeats we have. Um, H for honor. I, I feel like I know how to do that. I can do honor. E for excellence. Do things the best you possibly can. I feel I can do that. Advance the kingdom. Man, nothing drives me crazier than not advancing in life. So I feel like I can do that one. And, and, and together, together, like do life in community, have people who love you, have people who walk and journey with you. I'm like, well, who doesn't want to do that one? That one's easy. But I don't know about you, but reaching out, man, this is the hard one, I think. Am I the only person? I reckon this is the tough one because it's like, well, now, now I've actually got to put my faith in action and I've, I've got to make sure I'm motivated and I'm, and I'm doing something and something is happening, amen? So reaching out can be tough, but we want it to be motivated by love, amen? If you're writing notes, let me give you a couple of thoughts. Um, these, are not, these are not points or principles. These are just kind of things to remember. As you reach out, here are some things to remember this week. Number one, God will tell us what to say. Anyone feel a sigh of relief? Anyone ever wanted to reach out to someone, but you're like, I haven't got a clue what to say? Like, man, if I say it, it's gonna come out all wrong. I'm gonna mess it up. I'm gonna, it's just gonna come out bad. Um, like, it's, it's just gonna sound terrible. But I love what it says in Luke 12, and it's talking to a church that is under pressure, but I believe it really relates to this as well. It says, for the Holy Spirit will teach you. How many of you wanna be taught? Five of you. How many of you wanna be taught to reach your world? Come on now. It says, the Holy Spirit will not might, not possibly, He will teach us at that time what needs to be said. And He'll also teach us what we shouldn't say. <laughs> say that, don't say that. I, I heard a story recently, a true story of a, of a guy, he lived in a home and he had a next door neighbor and he'd known his neighbor for years. And uh, you know, they would talk at the start of the day, at the end of the day, putting the bins out. They'd have a nice conversation. But one day he really felt compelled that he needed to share the gospel with his neighbor. He, he, he's like, man, I've, I've got to tell this person how much God loves him and, and what God has prepared for him. And so he, um, he felt pretty nervous. He really didn't want to do it. He, he was terrified to talk to his neighbor. But 
he kept on getting this conviction. Now I've got to share something of God's love. I, I, I've, I've got to do it. And eventually he worked up the courage and at the end of one day, his neighbor came home from work and he got into a conversation and, and, and he just kind of mumbled out and blurted out this just absolute kind of awful excuse for a message of the gospel. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Like it didn't come out right, it didn't come out beautiful. It was just like, you know, he was so embarrassed about how bad it had come out. He just kind of, you know, quickly ended the conversation, ran into his house and hid for the next couple of days. Thought he'd done a terrible job. But a couple of days later, his neighbor came and knocked on the door. And he said to him, I cannot stop thinking about what you told me about two days ago. Will you tell me more? And he was able to lead his neighbor to the Lord. And it just is such a great reminder. It's not even what we say. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart. But if he hadn't said anything, I'm not sure the Holy Spirit could have done his work. Come on, there are people in our world right now that God is wanting us to get the courage to, to share something of God's love and God's peace and God's joy and, and, and the destiny that we have in Him and eternal life that starts today, someone who leads us through everyday life. And, and there's got to come a moment. And I want to say this, you know, preaching the gospel isn't the first thing we do. It's, it's normally the last thing we do. The first thing we do is love people. The first thing we do is show them we care. The first thing we do is journey with people through their difficulties and their pain. The first thing we do is we stand with people when they're struggling in their marriages or their kids are having a tough time. And then, God willing, there'll be a moment that opens up when we can take that opportunity. And you might fumble it. And you might think you dropped the ball, but we just got to trust God that He's been working all along. And if He initiated it, He's going to complete it. Amen? Number one, just things to remember. Remember, God will tell you what to say. Here's the second thing, though, we got to remember, and this is pretty powerful. Number two, we got to remember that we have the truth that sets people free. we we got to remember that. Man, I'm, I'm often confronted with that reality as I walk through life and I see people in difficult situations. I've got to remind myself, man, I have and you have as followers of Jesus the truth to set people free. That's powerful. That's, a, what a, like what a, that's amazing. When we see dysfunction and we see brokenness and we see things that are not working well in people's lives, we don't just need to go, well, I don't know what to do. We have the truth to set people free. Oh, you guys are not excited this morning. I'm telling you, 9.30 was standing on their feet and... Come on, that's exciting. We have the truth that sets people free. Um, about three months ago, roughly, I, I was walking from where I parked my car to our college building. And to get from where I parked my car to college building, you go across the Heath, which is where Heathside School is. And um, I guess it was 8, 8, 15 in the morning, something like that. And, and the heath is full of these high school students. I don't know how many were there, 100, 150 of them. And you can picture the scene. They're in their school uniforms and they're, they're standing either in groups or they're standing by themselves. And they're basically all on their phones uh, looking at something. You can imagine it. And, um, you know, it was just another day walking to college. But as I, as I was walking there... Um, man, God really caught my attention. And as I was walking there, I just felt the Holy Spirit say to me, you have the truth to set these young people free. And right now, the young people in our schools and education systems are under some serious pressure. The enemy is having a riot right now with young people right across the planet. And fear is normal and anxiety is normal and for some not even been able to get to school is normal and self-harm and suicide and depression and oppression and all sorts of these things, mental health issues that are messing with them and stealing and robbing from them. And I, I, in that moment, I just felt like a burden come upon my heart. I just felt the Holy Spirit say, you have the truth, Mark to see these people set free, what are you gonna do? 
think it was the next day I was praying, I was fasting, and I walked to a coffee shop where I live, and I opened my Bible, I opened my notebook, and, and, and I, I ended up in Matthew chapter 10. And in Matthew chapter 10, it's where Jesus sends the disciples out to go and minister into their world. He sends them out two by two. And he gives them real detailed instructions on how they're to go. They're to find a man or woman of peace. And if they're received, stay with them. If they're not, they're to move on. And, and then he tells them kind of all these different things. And, and, and then he says these four things, and I wrote them down. It was, I felt like God was giving me a line by line assignment on how we could help young people. It says that, he says they're to go, and number one, they're to heal the sick. They were to heal the sick. What is the sickness? found in so many of our young people today, it's anxiety, it's fear, it's depression. And as I read that, I thought to myself, God, well, we know how to deal with that. Well, we have people in this church that know how to people to come out of that and find victory and find freedom. He goes on and he says, heal the sick, raise the dead. Raise the dead. Well, like, man, we know how to raise the dead because that's about new life in Jesus. The old coming to life in him. And I thought, man, well, we know how to lead to people to faith in Jesus Christ. We can do that. It goes on and it says, cure the leper. The leper is the outcast. The leper is the one that is unhealable, that is untouchable, that no one wants to embrace. And I thought, God, we, we can do that. We can put our arms around those young people that no one else will put their arms around. We can do that. And then number four, it says, cast out demons. Well, we know how to do that. Cast out oppression and cast out the spirit of suicide and cast out the spirit of self-harm and any other thing that would bring a young person down. And as I sat in that coffee shop, I started to weep because I felt the burden of young people and what they're experiencing. And we have the truth that knows how to set people free. And I walked home. I walked home, and as I walked home, every time I thought about these young people, I just started to weep because I felt their pain. They are like sheep without a shepherd. And the wolf comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. By the way, I'm so grateful for the youth ministry that we have in this church, and You know, on a Friday night, this Friday night gone, I think we had close to 30 younger youth in one group and 25 youth in another group. And and I believe it's only a matter of time, but we'll we'll be starting new hubs of youth. And I'm so grateful for our young people that my kids get to go to an environment where they're taught the Word of God and they've got young people to journey through life with and they've got leaders like Nick and Sam and all the other crew that are praying over them and believing for them and interceding for them. And man, I'm so grateful for that, but, but what about those who are not here? What about those who are not here? And I, I just felt this burden come upon me, and, um, and so it's pretty exciting. I, I, I went away, and I, I felt like God just gave me a, a map of what to do. We were not to approach schools and say we're here, but we were to go to the teachers in our church, of which there are probably 30 plus and we're to say, hey, would you be a man or woman of peace for us? Would you invite us in? And if we come in, I promise we will bring the best program that you have ever seen uh, anybody bring in. It will be excellent. It will be outstanding. But it will teach young people how to get over fear. It will teach young people how to break the spirit of depression. It will teach young people how to come to school every day. We, we, man, we, we know how to do it. And listen, we can't do overt evangelism in schools, but we can do covert evangelism in schools. Amen. And here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. It looks like coming and releasing the love of God into every classroom and over every young person. It's not about teaching them this way, this way, that. It's about releasing God's love in those places. And so uh, we now have the amazing Sam Malcolm uh, employed by our church. He is already pulling it together. By the end of the year, we will trial it in several schools. And by January 2024, my prayer is that we are in a different school every single week of the term, letting people know there's a better way, amen. Come on, give God a praise if you're excited about that. Woo!
And you have the truth to set your world free too. You do. You're an arrow for your world. I can't go to your world. I can't go into your world, but you can go into your world. I can't go into Johnny's world, but Johnny can go into his world. I can't go into Laura's world, but Laura can be an arrow to her world. I can't go into Gingy's world, but she can. I can't go into Glenn's world. Glenn's doing amazing stuff and producing music for a whole bunch of different artists and he's anointed. Steps into a studio. Carries the presence of God. Has a revelation of God's love. Release it. I can't go into your world, but you can go. You don't need to preach the gospel. In fact, don't preach the gospel until you've got people's hearts. But release the love of God. I'm not a teacher, but if I was a teacher, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd arrive early in my classroom every day and I would pray over every seat and I would intercede that not only would they succeed in life, but they'd have a revelation of God. That's what I'd do. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a dentist, I'm not a nurse. But I think if I was, I'd arrive early and I would walk the wards. <laughs> if I was a GP, I'd pray over my practice. If I was an accountant, I'd pray over the people that I do the books for. If I was a businessman, I'd pray over my employees, over their families. Because people need God. We have the truth to set people free. How about standing to your feet? I wrote down a couple of things that what stops us reaching out? Apathy. Apathy, it'll be all right. Lack of compassion. Not actually caring enough about people to do something about their eternal destiny. Not my responsibility, not my job. I hope you can see from Scripture that's not true. Lack of urgency. Lack of urgency. Do you know, I heard somebody say this recently. Every single day, if this doesn't touch your heart, I don't know, Will. Every single day, 48,000 people on this planet die without never having heard the Gospel. Every single day every single day. I'm telling you, this is urgent. This is urgent. This is not, let's do it in 2025. This is, man, we gotta go. <laughs> we gotta go. And I just wanna encourage you right now, you don't need to be the greatest preacher. You don't need to be the greatest evangelist. But if you would just be filled with God's love and be a conduit of that love, into your environment, your family, your workplace, your university, your college, wherever God has placed you. I just think the moment's gonna come when the heart opens up and we take the seed of truth and we place it in there and we let God do His work, amen. Come on, how many of you could say, I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. I could, I could take that into the world. How about just lifting your hands? Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Father, this morning, we receive your command that it is time to go into all the world and help people discover you. Father, right now, we say sorry for where we have been lacking compassion, where we have lacked urgency, where we have got used to the status quo, 
where we have lacked faith to believe that change, meaningful change can happen in those people that we love. And today, God, we we wanna be commissioned afresh to go, to reach out, and to make a difference. Just for a moment, just with your eyes closed, love asking this question, but who right now is near to you, but is far from God? Who's dear to you? but it's far from God. Come on, I want you to bring that person just before God right now. Prayer is so powerful. Prayer creates windows of open heavens over people's lives where God can touch hearts, where God as a good father can draw people home. So right now, God, we lift up family, friends, neighbors, work colleagues, people we hang out with, people in our world that are dear to our heart, Lord, but are far from you. And we receive a fresh commission to go out into this world and make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' name. Just with eyes closed, heads back. Maybe you're here this morning, never given your life to Jesus. I want you to know that Jesus died for you. paid the price of all your sin, all your independence, everything wrong that you've ever done in your life, He went to the cross for it. Three days later, He rose again, defeated the power of sin. The Bible says if we'll call on His name, He'll come and He'll live in our hearts. Give us a new future. Position us for all that He has for us. And all we've got to do is call on His name. Maybe you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. And today I just want to say, this is your invitation to come into life with an amazing, amazing Savior. Maybe you're here today and it's, in a way, your heart's been distant from Him. It's been hardened to Him. And today you can feel the tug of a good Father drawing you home. Love to pray for both of you. And I'm just gonna pray a prayer. We're gonna pray it as a church family this morning. And if you're here and you say, Mark, that's me, I need Jesus. How about you just pray this with me? We're gonna pray it nice and boldly as a church family together. Just say, dear Lord, today I thank You. You love me. You died for me. You gave Your life for me. You've forgiven me of everything I've done wrong. Today I receive that forgiveness and I'm set free from it. In Jesus' Name, come and live in my life be my Saviour and be my Lord. I give total control of my life to you today. I say thank you in Jesus' Name. Just with every eye closed, every head bowed, if you're here today and you say, Mark, that's me, either for the first time or as a way of recommitting your heart back to Jesus today, I'm just going to ask you in just a moment, just to lift your hand. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it before we close out church today. Would you just give me a wave if you say that was me? Just inviting Jesus afresh today. Amen. Can we just sing that worship song together, guys?